I never thought I could buy a $15 million building. I thought that's for super wealthy Bezos people and large corporations. And when I started learning this stuff, it was a huge aha moment of wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Made that cash. Oh. Under all is the land, the real, real of real estate. Courtney, your friends, about to show you how to generate wealth. Get educated, do for yourself. Add a couple notches to your belt. Under all is the land, under all is the land. Welcome to Under All Is The Land. I'm your host, Courtney Polis, here with my rock star co-stars, Soka Fernald. Hello. And Dominique Madden. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's getting wild out there, isn't it? Seriously. Wild. I know. We heard the news that these Starbucks are closing. We were just talking about it. It's like we all know that there are some serious situations, but the zombie Starbucks at Hollywood and Vine, Crazy. going out of business. They can't handle the tweakers anymore. <laughs> Well, employees don't feel safe, right? Yeah, that's yeah. why. Well, yeah, apparently it's not that they're not lucrative. It's not that they're not money, you know, money making locations. But apparently, it's just that the employees don't feel safe, and so they're deciding to close these locations. You know, I do think that's like a s symbol of an urgent and increasingly more urgent situation that for some reason our leadership just has not been able to solve in Los Angeles. hundred mm percent. -hmm. I mean, literally if I go, you know, just outside my door and walk 10 feet, I'll hit someone who's tweaking. Yeah. I walk another 10 feet and there's another guy tweaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like I can tell when the drug dealer's been around the block, you know. Oh, <laughs> it's, horrible. It's, horrible. it's so sad and horrible. And it really is It's sad. so horrible. It doesn't Think feel about safe. it though. Hollywood yeah. Boulevard, it's like the center right. of a uh, tourist yeah activity in Los Angeles. So it means something whenever a yes. Starbucks is closing there. Oh, people are getting attacked, you yeah. know, random attacks. Like I, there's no accountability from the city to take care of our And I saw problem. something else or too. Or a mental health problem. That's really right. a problem. Yeah, it's, yeah. And especially that, like you said, that seems. area, it's tourist heavy and that's where people come to visit LA, maybe, you know, save up all their life to go to LA finally, yay, we right. get to visit a big city and whatever, something important to them. And then that's what they take home. Right. Yeah. yeah. I we're was walking the, down we the street the... on Hollywood and it was so disgusting. It smelled mm -hmm. so much of mm -hmm. feces and urine mm -hmm. that we had to cross the street like, like New York. Like going to throw up. <laughs> yeah. Like straight up. In downtown, so bad. I had the same thing. Walking to the last bookstore, which is a super amazing, huge bookstore. And I felt unsafe in the daytime to walk from one block to that bookstore with my kid. It, I felt like we were walking through pee and it, it was just. Like I couldn't believe yeah, it. Yeah, and I posted that video on my social media of these kids getting off a public bus in San Francisco, and they just have to walk through these like tent cities of major tweakers, and mm -hmm. it's scary as hell. And it's like, what are we doing? Well, well we don't take do? care of, of people. We, we don't. We put all our money into shitty food and weapons. <laughs> That's what we do. What? Well, yeah. Did you see that? You know, the the Olympian was attacked downtown yes. by you know a homeless friend, a homeless, homeless guy person. threw a pull at her, broke her eye socket, looked horrible. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Was so bad. No accountability though. None. And then I saw that Gascon. It, it's like you know that people hate the job you're doing, right? And rather than doing something to change that around, being like, okay, I admit, like this policy, I thought was going to work. It's not working. It's not the right environment for it. Maybe we didn't have enough preparation for it. But instead of actually doing something about it, he proceeds to dismantle the committee or whatever that notifies people whenever somebody who hurt or injured one of their loved ones is up for parole so the victims can come to the hearings and give an impact statement or whatever. He dismantled that committee. What? And yet, on the Who other are you hand, working for? Also wants to, you know, he won't notify certain victims, but if it's a victim of an officer-involved shooting, he'll notify them. It's just interesting. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I just don't know. Picking and choosing. Picking and choosing, but also, like, you're not, it's like it's falling on deaf ears. A hundred percent. And I think that we need to choose our next mayor very carefully because if things continue and businesses such as Starbucks are shutting down because of this inability of our leadership to solve these problems, then I think, I think, you know, it's, it'll get worse. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 
Hundred percent. I just uh, and there was someone who was saying that they were talking to an officer friend, and you know they were saying that they were going to be moving soon somewhere else, and they're like, Psh, I can't wait to. You know, it's going to get way worse. And you know what makes them think that? I don't know. We'll see. But I know that you but know there certainly is enough money. It's just why don't we? Can we just take care of our the people that need? Well, it? you yeah. know there is, yeah. and there's somehow no there isn't. Network. Somehow there there's isn't. No I called nine one one yesterday, and I was on hold for a minute and a half. There was a fire in on the 134 at the 5, and I noticed there were no helicopters or fire department anything. And I, I called 911 for the first time in a long time, and nothing. Mm. Like, it rang, it rang, it rang, and then it put me on hold. I'm like, if I was seriously being injured right now, um, no, that's uh, yeah. I'd be dead. Yeah. And they'd never True. know why or where or mm-hmm. what. I, I just don't understand how a city with this much money or a state that had a surplus um, allows this to be tolerable, mm-hmm. you know? So anyway, yep. that's, that's real. That's really going down and kind of of the moment. But also of the moment is uh, diversifying our real estate investment so that we can win in any market. So do you have investment property yet? I don't. Why not? It's a good question. Okay. We're working on that? <laughs> well, working on it. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> what about unique? Well, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't say I have an investment property. I mean, I have a couple of properties and they're great investments. You know, they've gotten increases in, in the uh, appreciation Value. and, you know, I've built equity on those so I could use those to buy more properties. Um, but they don't produce like a monthly income. Mm-hmm. You know, one was for my mom and the other one's for me. So. Right. You know, at some point. (laughs) Right, right, right. Well, I think one of the things we learned, especially during COVID, when we saw what people were doing, like a lot of markets that are adjacent to Los Angeles that are kind of get out of Los Angeles markets, like Big Bear and the desert, they were on fire, Mm -hmm. you know? And people who had income property in those locations, wow, it was all of a sudden highly in demand. I got several offers on my investment property in Big Bear like unsolicited offers, um, people were definitely going there to rent, you know, were excited to like get out of town with their families or whatever and get out of the house. I guess yeah, like, a client of mine bought, in, home. bought this beautiful A-frame for 350 about mm-hmm. a couple of years ago mm-hmm. when, when COVID happened and everybody needed to move somewhere else and they remodeled it and they just sold it for 800. Wow. wow. That's amazing. That's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard also indications that some of that movement is softening, but I remember also we had a major exodus from like Highland Park and Eagle Rock for move up buyers who went into Altadena and La Cañada and Montrose. And like, they were just like, we want more land, we want more space. And it was causing crazy bidding wars out there, which was a shift that I don't think anybody could have predicted because usually people are like I want to walk to a coffee shop and yeah. you know no, now it's like, it's I like, want to be as far away from the coffee no, shop as I can, can. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll have the coffee come to my no more right. zombie Starbucks <laughs> we'll drive for coffee yeah. <laughs> or I'll have it brought to you I mean, right or have it brought to you Just, I mean, you bougie go on your app <laughs> right exactly. I've seen you order a coffee <laughs> I with yeah. Uber <laughs> But the point with is... With food. With food. Okay, that was a bagel. <laughs> a salad. Thank okay, you. Okay, you're right. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know what they had for breakfast. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that like when the markets change or there are these unpredictable changes that happen, if you have your money in different parts of the real estate market, you can definitely hedge the impact of a major market shift. So for example, in LA, when people stop buying houses and because they f- feel like they should buy when everybody else is, which is something we still haven't figured out. Um, uh, you know, the rental market goes up. So now there's like a ra- rental housing shortage. So if you own rental properties, you can charge a little bit more, you right. know, and like, so it always like moves around. It's like whack-a-mole. So you need to make sure when you're investing in real estate that you're thinking about the different places where you can diversify so that you can win like I said, in any market. Well, it, you know, it's it's funny because 
when you're in a period of inflation, the best thing to do is put your money somewhere that's more stable, you know, because as it's sitting in the bank, it's becoming less and less valuable mm -hmm. every day. You know, whereas your real estate asset, you can leverage for so many different things. Like, you know, the power in L.A., I always tell people, like, the power of real estate in L.A. is how many opportunities you have to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's for rent, like, to rent out to, um, to a long-term tenant, to rent out to, uh, you know, Airbnb, space. on yeah. peer space. You know, uh, you know, if you have a pool, there's Swimply, you know. Swimply. Swimply. Yeah. Swimply. 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 I don't know. No. But, you know, you yes. can rent your pool, pool is by the, the hour. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. That's you. Yeah. You know, yeah, you have opportunity. And mm. if you have land, you also have the opportunity to build, right? So you can add units. You can, you can get creative right. you with SB9. what you're doing. Mm. And you don't necessarily need cash to do those things. You can leverage your equity or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, pull in investors, whatever, but you have something right, that's not thing. decreasing in value, right? you know? Yeah, no, it's so, it's absolutely true. And then there's also like the by when you can, where you can idea that I heard Gretchen Pearson speak about, who's a like, you know, genius uh, real estate broker in California. And when she said that, I was, it really resonated with me because I hear a lot of people saying, well, I can't afford to buy in LA. And it's like, yeah, but you can afford to buy something somewhere. So let's figure out where that is and what that needs to be so that you can, you know, buy the next thing using the appreciation on this one, or at the very least have $500 a month profit you're making from this one contribute to your increasing rent in Los Angeles. You know, totally. One way or the other. Totally. It's a smart idea. I mean, we have a family member who's an agent in Pennsylvania and, you know, in, in their area, you might be able to buy something, you know, on the lower end for maybe you know, a hundred to 150 grand, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, for a monthly payment, it's like a few hundred Four bucks. Hundred. Yeah. But, you know, what you can get in rent for that same space is maybe a thousand a month, you know? Right. So you're already cash flowing. Right. What, every month, you know, on top of your mortgage payment. So use that to then buy your L.A. house if you don't have the, the money the to buy money. in L.A. Yeah. But even in that, like in mm -hmm. that conversation, too, a lot of people think they can't afford L.A., but not every house in L.A. is a million dollar house. There are two hundred thousand right. dollar condos. You know, like you go to Koreatown and you can find a condo for 300000 easy. There are many of them, mm -hmm. you know? So if you have, you know, $10,000, you might be able to buy that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very good point. Here to also address this point is Devin McNichol, the co-founder of Onsite Equity and our colleague in the residential real estate market in Los Angeles. I'd love to bring him on to talk about this and educate us and inform us on diversifying our real estate portfolio. Welcome, Devin. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, hey, high fives. <laughs> high fives. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Woo, woo. All right. Hello. 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 How are you? We're good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Yay. Yeah. You, uh, you were mentioning before that something exciting happened just now. You just got a text. Yeah, what is that? I, I just got a text that uh, one of my partners, I was just out in Tampa, um, Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater area, and we were touring a unit or uh, an 88 unit apartment building and mm -hmm. sounds like we're going to have it under contract here hopefully that's, by the end of the day wow that's amazing yeah. that's amazing thank you thank you mm -hmm. yeah florida's hot yes it is very hot it was in weather and in real estate i was going to say 90 plus degrees and humid but yeah but in real estate also yes <laughs> in real estate also <laughs> so and it's eight uh, units 88 units. 88 88 yeah. units okay big How, guy. what Let's, does that run how much do you uh, you're putting me on the spot here. I think it's going to be uh, fifteen five to $16 million. Seems That seems right. right. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure what 88-unit buildings are going for in Tampa right now, but it does seem cheaper than it would be in L.A. Yes, absolutely. And we can. I'm excited to talk to you about how we go about purchasing these. Well, let's go on into it. So your awesome. company is called Onsite Equity. How long ago did you found Onsite Equity? Co-found. So yeah, uh, Aaron Birnbach's my uh, best buddy and partner, and we got into real estate about four and a half, five years ago. Okay. Um, kind of a journey into that, but we found an on-site equity two years ago um, and have been uh, growing and expanding and, and loving it. Okay. So what types of properties do you purchase and like how is it structured? Sure, absolutely. So um, 
we uh, I guess just to go back a little bit, we um, met in a van and we met in a in a band. Not in a van. Well, I, it, it, we toured <laughs> in a van uh, for many years across the country together. Okay. And uh, if you can survive a minivan with four guys, you can pretty much do anything with them. And uh, Aaron and I, we finished the tour and. Um, and I listened for some reason I had on my Audible and ABCs of Real Estate Investing, mm. uh, Ken McElroy, great book, highly recommend it if you're interested in investing. Also a great book, Break Up With Your Rental by Courtney Bullis. Yes, Keep going. I was going <laughs> to mention that later, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, it completely changed my life. I was in the stock market and the ups and downs of the stock market and no control. And I said, wait a second, food, water, shelter. And shelter is a basic human necessity. And I have no um, exposure to this. I was in some REITs in the stock market, but said, I need to learn about this. And Let's so, talk about what a REIT is. Yeah, real estate investment trust. So if you have a uh, brokerage account with any big company or a 401k or a IRA or Roth IRA, you can invest in these. Um, and that's what I was doing before as part of my diversification in my stock portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, however, I wanted some more control over those. Um, and so instead of saying, hey, I'll buy some shares in these, um, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but at, when you own a share, you don't get the benefits of the actual ownership of uh, some of the tax benefits and a cash out refinance or the benefits of a sale of a property. Right. Um, and so those are some of the things, as I learned, I wanted to capture in purchasing myself. Um, and so Aaron and I took the real estate license exam on the same day. Uh, I wish I had the money. I wish I was in a super big, the Beatles rock band. But I was not, so we said, okay, we don't have money to go buy a $15 million building in Tampa. How are we gonna do this? And a mentor said, well, you should go learn from the inside out. So we said, okay, we'll get our license. Aaron took it in the morning. Um, I told him not to tell me if he passed or failed because I didn't want the pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, we both passed, <laughs> That's and, good. and here That's we good. are. Uh, so that brings us to uh, your question of how, how we got into this. And uh, through education, listening to podcasts, um, your show is awesome. Thanks. And uh, a lot of awesome information. People should definitely check out other episodes. Um, but checking these out, the, your show and other shows on investing in particular, uh, led us to some amazing mentors and friends and colleagues. And through that, we have now um, are able to say, hey, you know, we're going to be purchasing an 88 unit apartment in Tampa, hopefully right. in the next 60 days. Yeah. Wow. So, so over, like, it's fast. Yeah. For five years, let's think about that for all those people who are like, I can't afford to buy real estate. It's like he was in a minivan with four dudes yeah. four and a half years ago, but by the transformative power of real estate, he was able to educate himself, find the right people to go into this with, and ultimately take the money that he earns and turn it around and control it. The control part of real estate investing is actually a really important uh, thing to, to talk about because I know when I was a federal subcontractor employee, I remember like the 401k salespeople coming in and saying like, this is high risk, low risk, medium risk, and they were so used car salesy and I've talked about it a million times. And you feel like you have no control because you don't. And the stock market can be so artificially inflated or deflated based on Elon Musk making a Twitter announcement or you know somebody doing a thing. It's so unpredictable and crazy. So even though the real estate has this reputation based on the last crisis of being unpredictable, if you look at it in the long run, it's very predictable. It's like a reliable investment. So in terms of control, you have much more control in investing in real estate than you do in investing in stocks, 100%. That was, yeah, you hit it right on. Uh, I think like, you know, Apple's a great company and you can invest your stock in Apple, but unless maybe you're Tim Cook, I don't know if you can change the price of that. You know, you can go out and buy as many iPhones as you want, but I don't know if you're really driving the number. With real estate, you can really improve the value of a property. And thankfully, some of our recent regulation is allowing us to do that a bit more easily, making the ADU laws less restrictive, SB9. Like we do have some rules that are making it easier to like monetize your, your investment in real estate, yeah? <laughs> Yeah. Are you building ADUs? Are you flipping houses? Yeah. What else are you doing I also, other than yeah, buying big buildings? I want to go back a step too and say, because the journey of five years, I wish I could say that I'm purchasing this alone, um, but I was taught real estate's a team sport and investing in real estate can, can be a team sport. Um, and so I wanted to go back how you said how we're structuring those. So 
what we're doing, they're called real estate syndications. Mm -hmm. And I like to, um, I'm not sure how familiar your audience is with them. So I'll let's try and... go like people don't know. Okay, cool. So I try and explain them like we, we find an 88 unit apartment in Tampa. And even before that, we, we do a ton of research on markets that we like with uh, data, with job growth and population growth and diverse jobs. So it's not just the uh, Amazon warehouse, but it's hospitals and universities and, and Fortune 500 companies. And um, so there's a lot of research into the market and why we like the market. But so we find that I was out there and I was touring comparable properties to say, OK, what is this? building across the street look like? If I was moving to Tampa, St. Pete, would I live in this building or this building? And would I pay this rent or that rent for it? Um, so there's a lot that goes into that. Um, we do a whole show on that. Um, but when we finally come to an agreement, we, we set up an LLC to buy it. And I guess the easiest way I can explain it is 70% of the LLC ownership in this, in this case can change as anything in real estate is negotiable, but will be the money that's needed. So I think we're going to be raising 5.5 to $6 million. And that will include the down payment to purchase it and the renovation costs for the exterior and interior units. Mm -hmm. And then we always have holding costs um, in case all the tenants stop paying that we can maintain the building, um, et cetera. Then the other 30% of that LLC is the managing members, so the general partners. And we that those roles are divvied up by who found the deal, who's signing on the loan, um, who's doing the due diligence and inspections during the um, acquisition process, who is um, going to asset manage. So we always hire local property managers, but then who's on the phone with them when we're turning units every day or every week, uh, who's in charge of the accounting, et cetera. So we split that up. Um, and through uh, 506B and 506C, um, again, kind of more granular stuff, but we're able to raise capital. Um, through the syndications, and so what? What's like the minimum amount somebody could contribute? Do you have to have definite same members every time, or can there be like? Could Nick be like, I'll contribute to that? That yeah. sounds great. Great question. So we, uh, for this deal in particular, it'll be probably a fifty thousand dollar minimum investment, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so not super low amounts. I, I've done one which was twenty five thousand dollars. However, when you're talking about buying a $15 million building, it's awesome to say um, I'm able to get into and, and that's one of my big whys. One of my big, the passion of why I'm uh, in, in this business now is that, you know, my dad, my parents, phenomenal people, they weren't educated. They didn't have these podcasts like we're doing right now um, to get into these investments. And uh, so I, I'm trying to teach and educate people that have twenty five fifty seventy five hundred thousand um, dollars not not only that but it's a it's a chunk of their portfolio right. so maybe they have their 401k and they have their house with an ADU here but then they can say okay I'm gonna put fifty thousand dollars in this 88 unit in Tampa and then they will get passive returns let's um, talk about what a projected passive return on a fifty thousand dollar investment could look like in this scenario sure so the our goal is to double the money in five years uh, four to seven years is uh, projected and um, hold time. So it's not a get rich quick uh, Bitcoin selling mm -hmm. could go up, could go down crazy. Um, it's slow and steady apartments and we're adding value uh, to the community, to the tenants that live there as well as the investors all around the country really. Um, so they'll make, the investor will make cash flow throughout the hold from rents. So what would that look like? Again, just kind of keeping it small, like manageable amounts. Like yeah, sure. Somebody invests 50000 roughly what is the projection of what they would be receiving from rent? Sure, so I'll do 100000 to make the math a little easier in my mm -hmm. head. But we... Okay, I'll split it in half to make the math there you easier go, sir. in my head. So, <laughs> smarter than I am. So, 50, so we usually say, this one will be about a 7% a year. So if you're 100000 7000 $7,000 a year, 50000 3500 a year. Yeah. Um, one of the benefits of these deals, again, as opposed to a REIT, is that if we do a cash out refinance in year two, three, four, uh, sometimes we're able to return maybe 40 to 50 to 60% of your initial investment. Mm. So then if you put $100,000 in in year three, if we boosted the value enough and we do a cash out refi, you could get $50,000 back, hopefully, and you could put that $50,000 into a second building with us or with another investor um, and continue your money to, to flow that way. Um, and then a big chunk of the money comes on the sale. 
So I wish I could hold these buildings forever, uh, but again, yeah, I don't have the five to six million dollars to buy these on my own. So a lot of people want their fifty thousand dollars back after four to six years. Right. And so a big chunk of the profit comes then. So if you're making thirty five hundred dollars a year for five years, then at the um, again see the math. If you're putting a hundred thousand dollars and you get seven thousand dollars a year for five years, that's thirty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And then on the sale, we project you'll get sixty five thousand dollars back. So that would be a hundred grand total plus your hundred thousand initial investment. So you'll have a two two hundred thousand dollars back after four to six years. Is there a maximum number of people who can invest in a syndicate? Amazing questions. So yeah, so mm-hmm. if um, if you're an accredited investor, um, there are unlimited amounts of accredited investors. Depending on which, we have to have a, a our lawyer set up the private uh, PPMs, private placement memorandums, and depending on which we choose. Um, there are ways if you're not accredited to invest in these. I just have to have a substantial relationship. So uh, similar to a financial advisor, talk about your goals and risk tolerance and make sure you're sophisticated and know the risks. Mm -hmm. But we can have 35 investors that are not accredited um, in this deal. How does someone become an accredited investor? Uh, Great question. So it's um, per the SEC, um, it's your net worth is a million dollars, not including your primary residence. Uh, or you are making two hundred thousand dollars. You've made two hundred thousand dollars a year for the past two years as an individual, and anticipate making that again for the current year, or three hundred thousand dollars a year for the past two years as a married couple. I'm sure a lot of people that we know would probably qualify. <laughs> I mean, but I guess they don't want you to go broke. They don't want you to give all well, your money to this thing, and then you have zero dollars in the bank, and then what happens? Exactly. Right? So what's the, it, the risk? Kind of a catch twenty two, in my personal opinion, of the SEC has done this to protect. Uh, people that have say I only have fifty thousand dollars, and there are risks to any investment, and so. But sometimes these are amazing opportunities, and that's why I think it's awesome that if you're educated and understand the risks, you're able to do it. Because I don't want it to only be the wealthy getting wealthier. That's again part of my why to say okay, if someone has two hundred fifty thousand dollars, they could put fifty thousand in in my deal in Tampa, fifty thousand in. We have three deals in Oklahoma City, 50,000 in a deal we're doing in Virginia, and they can diversify their real estate portfolio, not only in multifamily, but in different states, in different Mm -hmm. markets, in different buildings. Let's talk about that for a second. How many different states are you guys in? Just those three or So we uh, we have a a 48 unit in El Paso, Texas. Okay. uh, Three um, buildings in Oklahoma, um, 1,430 and 40 units. And then we're closing next week on a 66 unit in Virginia. And then hopefully, like I said, in 60 months or in 60 days, uh, 88 in Tampa. 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 (laughs) So how do you choose what markets you want to buy? uh, You said like you want to make sure there's more than one um, type of business there. So it's like if the Amazon factory closes down, it doesn't take wipe the whole population out or something. But what are other factors like? What are yeah. other factors to consider? Um, I think initially we, we from the uh, top looking down, bird's eye view, it was um, people are moving to that city. Mm-hmm. Um, so there will be a need for housing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are diverse jobs. Like in Virginia, for example, right. there's universities in this town. There's government jobs. There's manufacturing. Um, and so if one big company leaves, there's still employment. Right. Um, and then actually, I forgot to mention earlier, but low crime is also on the uh, mm. on our radar. So you're not investing much in Los Angeles? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked that. So it's, uh, I was listening before I came in uh, and part of the topic of diversifying your portfolio. So we actually are. We, um, we have submitted the same syndication type deals in L.A. Okay. Um, and we have we bought a single family in Marina del Rey and we're doing an ADU. Um, I'm being very cheeky because obviously L.A. has... Amazing real estate. So I'm being a little bit cheeky when I ask that question, but you know, there are pockets where this homelessness and crime is really hitting heavy. And then there are plenty of places where it seems like it's missing, mm-hmm. you know. So Marina Del Rey. Yeah, and I think that anytime you have 13 million people in a county, there's going to be crime, unfortunately, mm-hmm. and there's going to be uh, people that need and want for various reasons. Um, but there's also such there's a reason there's 13 million people here. There's art and culture and mm-hmm. diversity and different languages and different mm-hmm. foods. And um, yeah, so 80, so house in, in Marina del Rey, um, we are adding an ADU. Yeah. And um, do you think that's the move right now is you have to add square footage? I think, uh, yeah, part of the framework of our apartments is buy right, finance right, and manage right. 
And so a big part of single family investing, I think when we purchase this house in the state of the market that we're at right now, and I know you're experts on that as well, the, we had multiple exits, mm -hmm. meaning we could buy this and we could flip it potentially and because we bought it at a low price for what we thought. Um, and if the market goes down and we can't make money on that, we could rent it and we could hold based on the interest rate of where we bought and still kind of break even and make a little bit. Right. With the ADU, we'll be cash flowing nicely. In our perfect scenario is that we add square footage and then we, we'd like to do a cash out refi, like I mentioned earlier, to get our month, some of our money back to the, then go buy another building and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of what Nick was talking about, like no matter what you buy, just the fact that you're buying a thing, now you have the opportunity to leverage that thing into creating wealth. Do you believe in the 60-20-20 rule? I was reading that earlier. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, I, again, part of our exit for the um, property we have here is, I know there's, you know, 30 day plus in Los Angeles for short-term rentals, but I think we could potentially do traveling nurses or, or offer some like to make a little bit more money in doing that. Um, Traveling nurses? You know, I have heard that's like a mm -hmm. big thing right mm -hmm. now. Actually, I was holding an open house recently and we have a studio. And so like, you know, the rents that you're seeing for a studio in that area right now are like between a studio ADU or between uh, like 2200 and 2400 a month. But I had someone come in and he said, you know, actually my mom lives, you know, like five minutes away and she has a studio ADU and she's running out it out to traveling nurses and they're paying 2,800 a month mm -hmm. for a studio ADU because mm -hmm. it's short term. So you can run it at a higher rate than you would for long term and it's a write off for them. So they're less pressed about the increased costs. Mm -hmm. Is that interesting? Yeah. Traveling a shortage, nurses. Exactly. shortage yeah. on nurses. And then I think nurses, it's quite, it's a good income. So I can see that there would be 2,800. Yeah, I mean, there's a, um, I think it's called Furnish Finders. Um, and again, a diversity and variety of, of investing. Even our 66 unit in um, Virginia that we're doing, we're going to offer some of those units as kind of midterm rentals for like not short term, like not a night, not a week, not a mm -hmm. weekend, but midterm three to six months. Because okay. the demand for those is very high there and traveling nurses need places to live. And they... Um, they will pay more with it being furnished. That's also high in Florida too, actually those three to six month rentals because people are relocating there. Yeah, you know, I just held an open house in Orlando last weekend and almost every single person who came through was from somewhere else. And they were staying in some hotel and it, it was like a hotel situation with their family for um, until they find the right place. But you know, if you, you know, if you could stay in one place for three to six months while you hunt for uh, a new property. I think that's there's a big demand there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is it's true. You know, now that you're saying that, I'm thinking about like my clients, and I have a client who is st moving into an Airbnb whenever they move in from out of town while they're doing their house hunt. And I have another client who's staying in an Airbnb while we're working on closing this one. They're moving mm -hmm. from out of state as well. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, midterm like, rentals. rentals. It's like test driving the mar like test driving your city you're going to be living in. Yeah. Yeah. We have to stay for a while to see where you yeah. like to live. And yeah, and especially now when buyers are being extra picky before they write an offer, uh, I feel like they're not making those trig like triggered you know buying decisions like they were even six months ago, but really mm -hmm. for the past like six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's been very quick. You have to make a decision now, 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 you know, and people are like, ah, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes making decisions they regret, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> you know, so now people are taking their time. So this seems like a perfect opportunity while buyers are being a little bit more picky to uh, to create rentals that have options like flexible rental buildings. Smart. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, I think. I think a lot of things. But did you already talk about what 60 20 20 is? To, no, to... why don't you talk about okay. it? It's the allocation approach. Well, no, go ahead. You have the, yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think if I remember from reading your awesome article here, that 60% is, is it apartments? Multi families. Multi family. Yeah. 20% is the short term rentals. Yeah. And then 20% is private equity. Private equity, yeah. Which goes to kind of how I started. We jumped right into what we were doing, but you could classify what we are, we're doing as a private, private equity. equity. Um, yeah. And to go back a, a second there, again, I could talk about, I'd nerd out on real estate like you all the Let's time. Let's yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so the, um, we do it building to building. So you can invest in funds, and some of my colleagues do it successfully, where they have maybe like a $10 million fund, or I know one super awesome 
woman who I think has a hundred million dollar fund. Um, she's phenomenal and you're investing into the fund and then they go out with that money and buy multiple buildings. What we're doing like is that we will present this 88 unit on a webinar to people that we know and people that are accredited and we'll explain all the reasons that we like it. And hopefully other investors like it like we do, but they might say, you know what, I liked your building in Oklahoma better or Texas or I already live in the, um, on the West Coast. Could you have something in LA I could do? And so you, also, you have a say in the building that you're purchasing, which I, I personally like because we look at I me, mean, Aaron and I underwrite and look at 80 deals to find one that we like. And that was kind of a number that one of our coaches put out to us initially. And I was like, no way, we're going to do it in five. And then two years into our journey in multifamily, we hadn't bought anything. And the, <laughs> the numbers were going great, analysis paralysis. And, and to go back analysis to the, the team sport thing is like, okay, I joined a mastermind and I travel I mean, like I said, I was just out in Tampa. We've gone to Austin and Kansas, uh, or Nebraska, Des Moines, um, Knoxville. I'm gonna, oh, went to Orlando, which I know you have an awesome presence in. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back there this year for another conference to network and meet people and check out buildings. And so a lot of time goes into it and energy um, in finding those. But as far as like the investor, um, you have a say in what you're investing in. Right. Um, and I've done it passively too. The El, the El Paso deal that I did was passive as a limited partner. So part of that 70% chunk of just the money. Um, and I guess to explain that a little further, the, the 30% that manages our side is called the general partnership. Um, the limited partners are the 70%. Um, that's and, just money, no say so. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and literally, I mean, it's not mailbox money anymore, but just a couple of days ago, I got my ACH income from that. And it's like, oh yeah, forgot about that. <laughs> Completely passive money, not doing anything on that deal, which is, so nice. I mean, what's better than that, right? That's why you get into the investments. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this market is always going to be good for somebody, right? And that's the bottom line. And I had a hypothesis, I think, on our last episode that a lot of the headlines that are scaring people are meant to drive prices down so that investment groups can um, acquire at a cheaper price. You agree with that? Wow, that, I did not think of that, but that's a really interesting take because yeah, I'm. There's ways to hedge against a recession, especially in multifamily, which I didn't talk about at all before. But we have super nerdy spreadsheet calculators in Excel where you we call it stress testing, and so Aaron and I <clears throat> will do four, five, six different versions of what outcome could happen with the building, of interest rates continue to go crazy. Um, our, our building is 75% occupied, 25% of people aren't paying rent. Are we still breaking even? Are we still be able to pay returns? I'm not sure if people are familiar with the term cap rate, but it's a, a variable that we use to determine the value of an apartment. Mm -hmm. If the cap rates are low, that's one reason I love apartments is that the, it's almost like a, it is like a business, like the, the banks and buyers value it by the net operating income you generate. So even if the values of homes in the neighborhood are down, if you've increased NOI, you can increase the value of your apartment building. And so, and again, recession resistant of people need a place to live. If unfortunately, if they're forced to sell their home, chances are they're probably gonna look at moving into a, an apartment building. Um, and so we're able to stress test these to say, if in two, three, four, five, six, seven years, we're in a, a terrible recession, are we able to maintain paying returns? Are we able to break even um, and then hold it longer so that we could sell it in maybe seven to 10 years and return people's capital? Um, and part of that's how we were taught through our, our coaching in this. Um, in fi my, my other finance, right, was talking about instead of buying with a, almost like a hard money loan, like a bridge loan, mm -hmm. it, which is due in 18 months to right. 24 months, right now we're getting longer debt. So five, seven, 10 year terms for commercial. So in case things change rapidly, we're, we're not forced to sell. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm throwing yeah. a lot at you. So, well, what yeah. I'm thinking right now um, is that, you know, if we as individual citizens want to use the bit of savings that we have as interest rates go up, maybe it's smarter to invest in a syndicate situation like this 
than it is to buy at a super high interest rate if they continue to go up and you feel like you can't get what you want. It just gives you another option. And now we're in the game winning with the Goldman Sachs and the Bezos funds and all that thing. So at least we're taking part of it as an individual citizen as opposed to just being at the impact constantly um, chasing uh, the market, you know? Inflation helps the wealthy. And um, what I mean by that from what I've read and what I've learned is obviously the, the common person, the cost of gas and food and, and rent goes up. But if you own assets like these, if your rent goes up, like I just mentioned before, your, your net operating income goes up, which means your asset increases in value. So back to my why, I never thought I could buy a $15 million building. I thought that's for super wealthy Bezos people and large corporations. And when I started learning this stuff, it was a huge aha moment of, wow, the common person, I mean, look, it takes a lot of work to save $50,000, but I'm gonna call that the common person for this. this yeah. And I don't wanna downplay that because yeah, if, if, no. you're, if you're watching this and you're like $50,000, I'm like, you can do it. You can you do it. You can do it. You can do it. But in terms of 5.5 million, 50,000 is a smaller number, okay? Right. So to be able to get into $50,000 investment, which is gonna be generating 7% for the next five years while the stock market is obviously super down and Bitcoin is super down right now, is incredible. It's a super incredible way to hedge against a recession and hedge against inflation, in my opinion. So this is the point, this is the point, is that when you're thinking about where to put your money in a market that is shifting, or just generally, you need to create investments that win under any circumstance. And real estate, more than the stock market, more than Bitcoin, has uh, some predictable outcomes. We've been through this before. We know what it looks like. It's not that scary. It's just a matter of educating yourself on the best place to put your money under different conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And if you want to, I have Bitcoin and crypto, and it, it was kind of the play money of I, I want to be in this when I meet people in LA here that are buying houses, I wanna be able to relate to them and say, okay, yeah, I have a little bit of that. To, but it wasn't my, my nest egg. I have money right. in the stock market as well. But I work in real estate, I believe in real estate, I see the value of it now, and, and so that's why I'm in it. Um, and yeah, I think you, you mentioned a little while, a few minutes ago, of, you know, maybe you should put your money in these. It's, I think it's a, a personal choice of, if you wanna be super hands-on, like, like the, the deal here in Marina del Rey, I'm on the phone with LADBS, the D Department of Building and Safety. I'm on with the contractor and I'm talking, you know, with the uh, Coastal Commission because we purchased there. And it's super yeah. time, like I said, the, the El Paso deal, I got an ACH in my bank account that was completely passive. Yeah, but that's this is the thing, is that it, a lot of people may be able to get $50,000 together or liquidate their 401k or do something like that but they don't have the hundreds of thousands of dollars together that you need to actually flip a house in addition to the down payment. And you've got hard money at a high interest rate and there are carrying costs and there's process costs. So for somebody who doesn't have the experience or a team where they're just kind of like buying into somebody else's project, mm, yeah. you know, this is an option. And it's a good option. Are you unselling it? I have it? so many things that no. I Are you unselling it? I know, I have so many things I want to say. <laughs> well, because you're saying not to have me 50 grand. Then you, but if you find a deal, you can call me and I will bring you the money. to And, and, and you can have a chunk of that 30% for finding the deal and I will teach you. And if you, I mean, these are things you can learn online, right? If you don't have money to flip, you can come to Courtney or Neek, I think I heard. Yeah, uh, yeah Dominique. I, I, I heard <laughs> Neek. I was like, oh, Neek. Neek is an affectionate nickname. I accept it. I guess maybe, yeah, maybe I'm not in the inner circle to call you Neek yet. You have now been blessed. There you go, yeah. <laughs> You've been welcomed. But my point being, there are ways, if you don't have money, to become a real estate investor. You, you, have, you can educate yourself, and you can find the deals, and you can uh, get, be a mentee. Um, what I took from what you were saying, and, and I know that this is actually also the experience of one of my uh, past clients who was a flipper and now invests in big apartments. And I know that what she said is it's such a headache to be a flipper because you're dealing with micromanaging all the moving pieces of that. You're dealing with, you know, buyers and their hang ups and everything that comes out of that. And when it comes to the big apartment, she doesn't have to do much except for, you know, I mean, obviously it's finding the deal. But when you find the deal and you buy the deal, then really, just like you said, it's more passive income after that. But there was something else when we were at 
my listing the other day that you had mentioned that I don't think we have touched Super on. Super nice listing, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but you had also mentioned the tax benefits that you see off of the large apartment investing. And I think that would be a really good thing for people to hear about and understand too because Let's go. they're yeah. huge. I mentioned that earlier too. So if especially if you're a real estate professional, and I want to preface this by saying I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a CPA. Mm-hmm. Um, Smart. But from my own experience and my own CPA, what they have told me, uh, let's go to the El Paso deal. So I put $25,000 into that deal. And over the course of the last, I guess now, year and a half, I've been getting um, quarterly distributions in the 6 7 8% range. So I'm making cash flow on that. However, at the end of in tax season last year, I got a K-1 from the LLC that, that owns the building that showed a $14,000 loss. And you're saying, wait a second, how is that possible? Depreciation? So depreciation. Cost of upgrades? So what we, <laughs> what we do manager? as uh, asset managers, mm-hmm. uh, that's, uh, so we're at managing the asset for the limited partners, the passive investors. Um, and by the way, we always put our own money in the deal. And if you find someone like me who doesn't, I'd be a little wary because I, you as the investor want to know that I have skin in the game. 100%. So that 30, 70, I always put my own money in the 70 as well. Um, just a little sidebar of that. Mm-hmm. But we we hire, uh, it's called cost segregation, and they go in and they, they check all of the things that can be accelerated. It's called accelerated depreciation. And they can check the HVAC units and the door handles and the appliances, and they can accelerate those faster than the IRS would normally for an for a exterior of a building. And so that's mm-hmm. how they're able to then send us a $14,000 loss. And so from my understanding and what I've been told from my CPA is that because I'm a real estate professional in LA selling houses and investing full time, I can use the $14,000 loss against my other active income in real estate sales. So it kind of offsets my sales here. Mm -hmm. And this is not illegal. This is the way that the code is written. Um, If you're not a real estate professional, it gets a little more complicated. You can do it, but I think it expires after a certain, like in tiers of uh, an at some point, you can no longer use it, I think. But definitely chat with a, a CPA mm-hmm. about that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. How about that? Yeah. So it, it's uh, it seems like it seems like it should be illegal that you're saying, but like I know, yeah, except that Donald that Trump wrong. paid seven hundred dollars in taxes. I was just gonna that, say that the uber like, wealthy and what? and it makes sense They're to go loopholes. back to it goes back like to my why of trying to educate the common person that that my parents were not taught this stuff historically wealthy people are in congress and so and who's writing the codes and making the laws right. and who owns the hmm. real estate yeah. in the country the wealthy yeah and so it makes sense doesn't follow it follow the money if if <laughs> yeah, i'm going to work every day and i'm paying rent on a place and i don't know any of this stuff for the rest of my life they're writing the code and, and benefiting off yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. And so I think education is the first big step. That's the key. And I'm happy yeah. if people want to reach out to tell them podcasts or you know things that I, or books like yours. Um, want to write a book? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, <laughs> okay, we got a plan. It. Yeah. We should at least be giving seminars because this is good. Yeah, it's totally. super, like I said, like a big part of my journey and why I want to do it. It's, it's in, in coming up with $5.5 million, way easier for me to call business owners and wealthy people I've sold, you know, the big houses to here in LA that can cut a check for 250 or 500 grand. But it's so meaningful to teach someone. Um, and again, I don't like to take and to the only $50,000 somebody's has, but if like if they have a little bit of money saved up and they say, "Hey, what should I do with this?" and you educate them and the light bulb goes off, "Wow, I can get into this." It's a really meaningful thing and they get their first distribution. It's it's really cool. Yeah, it is really really cool. Thank you so much. I feel like we could talk for an hour, but we, we appreciate could. you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to doing big things with you in the future. Or writing a book. Yeah, man. Thank Let's you so do much. it. Yeah. No. I'll take the residential piece. Can you I take say one more thing? Stuff thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just want to, like, there was one thing I wanted to touch on as well in saving that $50,000 to start. Uh, and it's been a big, like, um, mindset shift or kind of how I always thought, but like sacrificing now to enjoy in the future. And it's like, like for example, I sell houses here, but I, I don't drive like a super nice Maserati or, or nice car. I'm pretty humble in that because the money I'm making or like your example of your client who flipped houses to put it into apartments, I'm selling houses to put it into apartments. So hopefully in five, six, seven, ten 10 years, I could Make not have to rewards. work as, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Yeah, good advice. Thank you for having me. Sage advice from Devin McNichol. Thank you, Devin. That was awesome. I'm so impressed with Devin. I learned so much. Yeah, that was fascinating. I feel schooled. Yeah, I'm curious now. He's Mm -hmm. definitely well versed in it. I love it. He is, and I love that he comes from a position of like us. Like Mm -hmm. where it's like, we weren't taught about this stuff. Like somebody Mm -hmm. had to teach us how money works Mm -hmm. and there's so many more ways to learn how money works, Mm -hmm. you know? So I would love to have him come teach a class or, you know, have an event where members of the general public can come and learn. I think that would be huge. We should totally do that. 100%. Totally. Yeah. Um, So I was reading this article, which is an article he was mentioning that I've had on the table here because I've been like just looking at it and trying to figure out what takeaways there are in it. And one of the things it says is the ideal scenario for any real estate investor is at a minimum doubling your cash flow from the same square footage you receive with a single family property. And, you know, it's that obviously putting 50,000 in and getting 100,000 out a couple years later, that's pretty solid in terms of doubling your money. But then also it talks about vacation rentals and in places where you're buying where they don't have the 30 day restriction, you can literally triple your profit over what the regular, you know, rent would be. So vacation rentals in areas that are less restrictive can be an easy way to like really make a quick return on your investment. mm -hmm. Yeah. You just need to make sure that if you're looking at any of those areas that you're looking at what they're proposing and Mm -hmm. what your other exit strategies are, just like he was mentioning as well, because I know that in Atlanta, for example, they didn't have as much restriction on Airbnb. And then all of a sudden it was like, I think each person can only have one or two Airbnbs Mm. or something like that. So people who had portfolios of 10 are Mm -hmm. freaking out, right? you know, and now they've got to sell and look at the market, you know? Or some areas don't no longer allow Airbnb, you know, where you first get in thinking you can, like Temecula. The hotel lobby is serious business. Or Palm Springs has heavy rent restrictions for Airbnb. But we booked an Airbnb in Temecula. What are you talking about? Marietta. Yeah. Yeah, but but they had Temecula too. Avant Stay must just just be. (laughs) Don't <laughs> no. cut it. No, but no. I'm but, sure they're playing by the rules and paying their fees and whatever. Like I have a big bear rental. They changed the rules a little bit, but you know we still qualify and you know we're still able to pay their licensing fees and the extra fees and everything and still be profitable. Yeah, I mean, I think that I just think that the point is like you know, go where you can make your money work for you. But also know, you know, figure out if there's other alternative ways yeah. that it could also work for you in the same space. Yeah. In my book, I talk about what I know really well, which is renovation resale. And I know a lot of people don't have money to get in, but they have other talents like they're designers or they want to be designers or they love choosing fit and finish or they have the time to be project managers for flippers who don't have that kind of support. And that's a way for you to like maybe use what you have other than money to become a partner and learn the business and figure out how to get in. So to me, the most compelling thing about the interview today was for people who were, this is completely over my head, you know, in certain ways, I'm like, oh, uh, it feels like a palatable way to make your money work for you and something that people can have access to, you know, and a, a proven return. And it's all about choosing trusted people. You know, totally. like he said, people exactly. who have their own skin in the game. Exactly. I would feel safe with him investing something because yeah. I have the feeling like he's legit. He means what he says. Right. And he's in it as well. Yeah. I think that's the challenging part for people. Like, where do I start? Like, right. who can I trust? Right. Who can I trust? Well, you can always trust us here at Acme Real <laughs> Estate. I'm your host, Courtney Polis. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. We will catch you on the next episode of Under All is the Land. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Tell all your friends. Tell your mom. <laughs> hey, LaCroix, we're waiting on our free drinks. <laughs> Yay. Yay. All Yay. That oh. Under All is the Land, real, real real estate. Courtney and friends about to show you how to generate wealth. Get educated. Do for yourself. Self.